I want to begin this morning by reading a little bit of an excerpt from an article written by a pastor, J.D. Greer. He says, each year, the nuns in our society, now that's not the Catholic Church kind of nuns, it's spelled N-O-N-E-S, those who check none for religious affiliation. Each year, the nuns in our society grow at an astounding rate. Some have used those statistics to declare the end of the American church. And while this fear of secularism is a bit overblown, the stats do raise an essential point. Churches that want to reach nuns need to retool. Nuns do not saunter their way back into church because a particular pastor is super engaging, the music is cool, or the guest services are Disney-esque, like Disney. Nuns feel like the church is a separate world in which they have no part. A British friend of mine, Steve Timmis, cites a study in Great Britain in which 70% of Brits say they have no intention of ever attending a church service for any reason. Not at Easter, not for marriages, not for funerals or Christmas Eve services. 70%. Great Britain may be a few years ahead of the United States in the progress of secularization, but judging by the rapidly increasing presence of nuns, this is where we are headed to. That means that each year, the pie of people in our communities who will wander into our churches is shrinking. Thus, if we don't equip our people to carry the gospel outside of our gatherings, we will lose all contact with the unreached people living around us. Without a new strategy, the future looks like a few flashy megachurches fighting for larger pieces of a shrinking pie. But that doesn't have to be the future of the Western church. We can reach the culture, but we need to think about growing the pie. And that means teaching our people to engage people with the gospel outside the walls of the church. End of quote. Now, of course, the church is not a building. This is a church building, but it is not the church. We, together, are the church, and we are outside the walls of this building all week long. And we need to take Christ and hold his name high, as we've been singing, out there all week long. The biblical model of evangelism is every believer sharing his faith to the lost with whom he has contact. Now, we can give the gospel in the church, and we need to do that. It's good for us to, of course, remind ourselves of it. It's good for us to share the gospel with those who may not understand it or need to understand it in a deeper way or whatever, or those who have never put their faith in Christ. That's great. But the bulk of the people who need to hear the gospel won't show up here. They are out there, and we need to share it with them. And this morning, we come to our passage in our study of Colossians in chapter 4, um, verse 3 and 4, which tell us about that important opportunity to share the gospel. And we want to see this morning that we are to pray for and use opportunities to share the gospel with those who do not yet know they are on their way to heaven. That is part of our task as believers. Now, let me read, follow along with me, Colossians chapter 4. I'm going to read verse 2 since it is part of the sentence, and we looked at it two weeks ago. Colossians 4, 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. I'm reading from New King James. But we will see this morning that we are to pray for opportunities to share the gospel. Now, first of all, in the first um, half of verse 3, we see that our prayers for one another ought to include asking God to open opportunities for us to share the gospel. Do you ever pray that? 
for a brother and sister in Christ? You ever pray that for your family members? God, give my son or my daughter or my mate or my husband today at work or my children at school or, or um, give my friend the opportunities to share the gospel and to take them. That's what today's message tells us out of this passage. We ought to be praying for those opportunities. As part of Paul's command to those believers that they should be diligent in prayer, which we looked at, verse 2, two weeks ago, as part of that, he asked them to pray that God will give him opportunities to share the gospel. Now, Paul is writing this from prison in Rome. There's lots of things he could have asked for. What would you have put on the prayer list or the email or the text today? If you were a prisoner in Rome for sharing the gospel, and the prisons weren't like they are today, okay? We understand. We've had people stand on this stage from other countries and who've been in prison for their faith and say, I visited your prisons here. They're not prisons, they're hotels, okay? Very different, our prisons, than the prison Rome, you know, in Rome that Paul was in. What would be on your prayer request list? What if you were Paul, would you most likely have asked prayer for it? Well, you can think of all kinds of things, right? I mean, if you're going to Paul ask about doors, verse 3, uh, pray that there would be an open door. Let's pray that the prison door would open and I can get out of here, right? That would have been the door to be focused on. Okay, Paul, I, I, I don't know. Or comfort. Paul could have said, hey, these chains are too tight and they're rusting and in, in the humidity climate and, and they're uncomfortable and they weigh me down and they're causing me health problems. And um, he could have prayed for his treatment by the guards. I mean, he was a you know, political prisoner in that sense for uh, preaching the gospel. And Caesar thought maybe that was disrupting the empire. And against Caesar thought he was a god. And Paul's preaching about a different god. I mean, I don't think his treatment by the guards might have been all that great as a political prisoner who they saw maybe against the empire. And Paul could have, you know, prayed for better treatment by the guard. Food. Uh, most prisons were down in a pit. And they just let food down through a hole in the floor. Um, you know, food, uh, wow, the food they give us, you know, that, that's, that's not going to help me health-wise. Good health, all kinds of things. Safety for those who are coming to visit me. We'll talk about that next Sunday. Uh, he could have prayed for all kinds of things in his dire situation. But he asks his readers, these believers, pray diligently. Pray, and while you're praying, pray for me. And then he gives this request. As you're praying, verse 2, meanwhile, praying also for us, that God would open to us a door for the word. The word of God. And he qualifies that to speak the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ. Turn with me. We'll come back to this. Turn back a book or two to Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. What might Paul mean by the mystery of Jesus Christ? <clears throat> Ephesians 3, 1 through 7. Another book written from the same prison, by the way. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. What is that mystery of Christ, Paul? Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of man in the Old Testament as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. Here it is. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his 
power. There is a mystery that no Old Testament prophet knew. Not even Daniel, not Ezekiel, not Isaiah. None of those prophets understood this mystery. It's only revealed now by the Holy Spirit. And I, Paul, have been given a part of fulfilling that mystery. And the mystery is, verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ, which of course was supposed to be in the minds of all the Old Testament uh, people as they sacrificed, their sacrifices illustrated a coming Messiah who would come and finally really pay for the penalty of sin, which they were just temporarily covering over and atoning for, and that Gentiles and Jews who put their faith in Jesus Christ would receive the gift of eternal life, forgiveness of their sin, based on Jesus' death on the cross. That is the gospel. That is the mystery. And that is why Paul was called as an apostle to the Gentiles. And that, by the way, is why he was in prison. We won't take time this morning, but if you go back and read in Acts, I believe it's chapter 15, where Paul gets, he's speaking to the Jews, explaining the gospel message that he is preaching because they're, they're, this is a tense situation. They're accusing him. But the moment he mentions that the gospel is also for Gentiles, they cut him short, arrest him, and that's why he's in prison. They absolutely, they don't like the fact he's preaching Jesus Christ, but they absolutely hate the fact that he's out there preaching Jesus Christ to Gentiles. And Paul is sitting in prison writing this because he's fulfilling God's call to preach the gospel to Gentiles. Both Jew and Gentile who put their faith in Jesus Christ become children of God and have the gift of eternal life together. They're in the same body, the church of Jesus Christ. Wow. And so Paul is asking for prayer that the door would be open, opportunities in prison for him somehow to get that gospel out to people. The good news that Jesus Christ gives eternal life to anyone, Jew or Gentile, slave or free, man or woman, doesn't matter. Anyone who puts their faith in Jesus alone for eternal life receives that gift of eternal life and is assured in the promises of God that they're going to heaven. And that's why Paul is in prison and he's praying for opportunities to do the same again. Is that what you would have done? You see, you can imagine that um, Satan would be, or his de demons, would be uh, sitting on Paul's shoulders suggesting, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that because you're in prison for preaching the gospel to Gentiles, that wasn't very smart. It didn't work very well. I mean, after all, to preach the gospel, you've got to be free out of prison. And so you need to change your message somehow. That's what our culture would say, wouldn't they? Our culture would tell us, change your message. This is not politically correct. This is not doing you any good. This isn't getting you where you want to go. This is not going to reach you, help you reach your goal. Our culture and our schools and all tell students today, you know, don't mention Jesus Christ here. Did you see that in the news? Don't even say, God bless you when someone sneezes. That's outlawed in the university classroom in a certain place in our country. Don't even mention that. That's off limits. Our culture says, don't you come to, to the job and work and talk about God or ethics or anything. That is not politically correct. It's not allowed here. They don't want to hear anything about Jesus Christ in the marketplace. And of course, we listen too much to um, those demonic forces in our flesh that say, you know, that wouldn't be wise to disobey that. We better just you know, not create any waves, and we better just be careful and not let anybody know we're a Christian. We'll just be it in secret. We'll just hide. Paul's saying, no, I'm in prison for giving the gospel, and pray that I can keep giving the gospel. <laughs> wow. You know, Paul Bunyan also was put in prison. I'm sorry, John Bunyan, not Paul Bunyan. John Bunyan. <laughs> Wrong guy. John Bunyan was also put in prison for preaching the gospel in England, I believe. 
He was arrested and preaching for preaching illegally and put into prison. That was preaching the gospel. The church and the king didn't want preached. And he was told that he would be released if he promised to stop preaching. So all you got to do is meet this condition. Just stop preaching the gospel and we'll let you out of prison. And how did he respond? He says, if I am out of prison today, I will preach the gospel again tomorrow by the help of God. Wow. That's a commitment like Paul has. Do we have that kind of commitment? We're not in prison. And um, we don't have an imminent threat right now. There are people in this world who would go to prison for preaching the gospel, and they do. And they preach it in prison, thank God, like Paul did. But you and I, no, well, we could be derided and laughed at and scoffed at and, um, you know, passed over for certain things and so on if we stand up for God. We sing about glorifying God in our lives and making him shine in our culture. We sing about that inside the walls here, but are we willing, like Paul and like many of these people, brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, are we willing to be open about Jesus Christ out there? What opportunities, you might ask, would Paul possibly have had in this pit in prison? Well, again, let's flip back with me to the book of Philippians, all right? Book of Philippians, chapter 1, 12 through 18. Let's see what kind of another, another book written from prison. Let's see what kind of opportunities Paul might have had uh, that these people prayed for and God answered and gave him. Philippians 1, 12 through 18. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Oh, that's what Paul wanted people to pray for, right? So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. He didn't hide it. He wanted everybody to know why he was in prison. And this is the message that I was preaching. And they all know it. Do you get the picture that no soldier could be within chain to Paul or within hearing distance who did not hear a very clear explanation of the gospel? You got it? By the way, earlier, Paul and Silas, what do they do in prison? They sing at the top of their voice. <laughs> Praises to God. Everybody hears it. Okay, verse 14. And most of the brethren in the Lord, most of the believers, having become confident in my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. My boldness in prison is a model, is an example. It's inspiring other people who are not in prison to preach the gospel more boldly. That's what you and I ought to do. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy or strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. And the theme of the book of Philippians is rejoice, rejoice. I'm in prison for the gospel and I'm preaching the gospel from prison. Rejoice. Isn't this fabulous? Fantastic. Look later in the book of Philippians chapter 4. Verse 22, ending the book. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. <laughs> I want you to know, especially you've now got brothers and sisters in Christ right in the household of Caesar, the dictator of the empire. The gospel will go everywhere, just like the crickets and the mice. Nowhere can keep it out, and Paul's getting, finding ways to get, give the gospel to people who are then carrying it right on up into Caesar and household, who claims to be God himself. And there are people believing that gospel. Pray for open doors for the gospel, the word of God, the mystery of Jesus Christ. And God answered those prayers and opened doors of opportunity for Paul. Thank God. 
Would it be that you and I would pray and be as committed as Paul to get the gospel even to the most resistant places? Wow. You know, there's places in the world today where people are being beheaded and killed for the gospel. And yet there are many people flocking to Christ. What they see happening in other religions like the Islam and all of the um, tyranny and, and violence and all, and they begin to say, this is not what the religion we want. This is not what we thought it was. And they are searching and they are open. And more and more people are coming to faith in Christ. God is using the blood of the martyrs, as he often has, persecution, to spread the gospel and to take it to unbelievable places. And people who we thought were totally resistant are open to it. Wow, that's what we should be praying for. This is great. And this is Paul's prayer for his brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for him. Well, if Paul asks for prayer for opportunities, then certainly you and I need to be praying for opportunities to share the gospel. We ought to be praying for one another and requesting prayers. What kind of prayer requests do you give? Now, there's all kinds of things we can request prayer for, and you know, none of them are really wrong. But the important things, out of all the things Paul could have asked, he's asking for opportunities to share the gospel. Is that ever one of your requests? Brothers and sisters, pray for me this week that I can be a good witness in this tough situation. Pray for me at school, more and more antagonistic to Jesus Christ. You can say anything about any religion. Teachers, as you read in the news, are asking students to, to write you know, assignments. The only God is Allah. All kinds of things happening in the public school, except Jesus Christ. I mean, he's a total rock of offense. They are totally objected to that. Help me to be a witness in these hostile places. Students who go to universities, one of the more hostile places on the planet probably today, or at least in our culture. Wow. We need to be asking prayer so that God would give us opportunities and that he would, we would take those opportunities to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We ought to be... I won't ask for a raise of hands. Don't, uh, don't. So many times we pray, God help the missionaries wherever they are. Just a general statement, right? We need to be praying specifically. Paul is asking for prayers specifically for opportunities in his tough situation to share the gospel. We ought to be praying specifically for our opportunities and opportunities for brothers and sisters in Christ here in this church and in this city and in our country and in the world. We need to pray specifically for these missionaries who are out there and for us. We're witnesses here at home. We need to pray. You know, I mentioned the 90 Minutes, uh, 90 Minutes in Heaven movie, uh, which Sharon and I had the privilege of seeing this week. And there's a couple things that I walked away from that with. Um, number one, okay, there's the picture, thank you. Number one, uh, and I don't want to ruin the movie for you, some of you have maybe read the book, but it's a great story. You know, during this man's recuperation, and he had so much pain from this horrible car accident, you see at the end when he leaves the hospital, he asks the doctor, Had, how bad was I when I came into this hospital? A sort of emergency transferred him into a bigger hospital because they needed the biggest trauma center, Houston, Texas, the biggest in the state. And the doctor said, well, I've seen worse, but none of them live. And he had a long, painful recuperation period. And you know, during that time, his memory of being in heaven was more of a detriment than a help. He did not want to be back here on earth suffering all this pain. I mean, God, just take me home, I give up. And he's really quite depressed. Uh, you're struck with that. And the second thing I'm struck with, that he keeps this all a secret. He never tells anybody, not even his wife, who is so faithfully caring for him every day. He doesn't tell anybody, he keeps it a secret. I'll let you figure that out at the end, how, how that comes out and how he changes. But he keeps that a secret. And I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I said to Sharon on the way home, 
Why would he have kept that a secret for her for all those months? Why he's so depressed and so on? And never mentions it. That's what his best friend asks him when he finally leaks it out. Why have you never mentioned this before? And then I thought, you know, God must think that of us. He's given us his word, the description of heaven and hell. Why do we keep that a secret? Why is not that the most important driving, motivating force in our whole life? To tell people with whom we relate and, and touch and, and visit and uh, work and go to school and neighborhood. Why is that not that warning about you need to put your faith in Christ so that you can enjoy heaven rather than hell? Why is that not, why is that a secret? God must shake his head at us as well. Go see the movie. It'll be good, inspiring to you. You know, if you've looked around at our church over this past several months, you've seen that um, attendance is really not going the right direction. Now, there's all kinds of reasons for that probably, and we need to be aware of those and do our best. But any church, any church who is not serious about outreach, inviting others, Getting the gospel to those who need to put their faith in Christ, bringing them for discipleship. Any church that is not serious about outreach is in a lethal path. That will be lethal. The church will die. We are saying in our nation right now what happens when believers, the church of Jesus Christ, is not reaching unbelievers in the culture. And the consequences are monumental. We need to reach out. We need to be giving the gospel. We need to be inviting others. We need to be inviting people. There are people out there who are not growing spiritually. They're not in the right setting. They attend some churches where God's word isn't taught um, like it should be. We can invite them here as well. That's OK. But ideally, our growth would be as you and I reach unbelievers. They're not going to wander in here accidentally. We need to take the gospel to them. We need to show them with our lives and our words, both. It takes two. Uh, you, you, giving the gospel, if you're a hypocrite and, and disobey everything and don't live like it, doesn't, is incredible. But living a good life and never giving an answer for why, where the power comes from, is also doesn't work. It takes both, living a life and sharing the gospel. And you and I need to be taking the gospel out there to the marketplace, the university, the classroom, the neighborhood, your place of work, whatever it is. And we need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ so that the church grows. That's very, very important. And then, of course, this is in the context of prayer, isn't it? Sharing the gospel needs to be empowered by prayer. You and I could talk all day long, <coughs> sing all day long. No word we could say or sing could ever change anybody's spiritual life. We don't have that power. Now, God has chosen to give us a part in the process, and he's commanded us to be a witness and be his ambassadors and all of that we've looked at before. But prayer, we need the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit to use us and help us communicate clearly. We'll talk about that in a moment. And we need the supernatural power of prayer to change, to convict them. I can't convict them that they are a sinner. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And they need to put their faith in Christ. So this is a supernatural process. It's never going to be attained by my own human strength alone or your own human strength. And it must be accompanied by prayer. That's why Paul is committed and dedicated to prayer. He's praying for these believers every day, as we've seen earlier in this book. And now he closes, comes to the near the end of the book, and he's asking them to pray for him, specifically that he has opportunities to share the gospel and that God's supernatural power will open those doors and that more people will come to faith in Christ. Warren Wiersbe says about this passage, and I quote, the proclamation of the gospel is empowered by prayer. The Spirit of God uses the Word of God as we come to the throne of grace and ask God for His blessing. 
We must never separate the word of God from prayer because God has joined the two together. And he points back and quotes Acts 6, 4, where we're told that those early apostles and church leaders said, we want to reserve, let's have deacons deal with a lot of the things that we need to in the church body because we need to spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Those are the two priorities. And then... Dr. Wearsby continues with an illustration. A visitor at Spurgeon's Tabernacle in London was being shown around the building by the pastor, Charles Spurgeon. Would you like to see the powerhouse of this ministry, Spurgeon asked. And he showed the men into the lower basement auditorium. It is here that we get our power. For while I am preaching upstairs, Hundreds of my people are in this room praying. Is it any wonder that God blessed Spurgeon's preaching of the word? Dr. Wearsby continues, you as a church member can assist your pastor in the preaching of the word by praying for him. Never say to your pastor, well, the least I can do is to pray for you. The most you can do is to pray. Pray for your pastor as he prepares the word, studies, meditates. Pray that the Holy Spirit will give deeper insights into the truths of the word. Pray, too, that your pastor will practice the word that he preaches so that it will be real in his own life. As he preaches the message, pray that the Spirit will give him freedom of utterance and that the word will reach into hearts and minds in a powerful way. And it wouldn't hurt to pray for your other church leaders, too, says Wearsby. Wow, praying... And sharing the word must go together. And that's what Paul is asking of his brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Well, secondly, we see in this passage, we need to pray for boldness in witnessing. If Paul needed for his being bold in sharing the gospel, if he needed prayer that he would be bold in sharing the gospel, so much the more do we need prayer for boldness to share the gospel. In the second half of verse 3, I begin at the beginning. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door of the word, or for the word, to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in chains. Paul knows it, and he reminds his readers you need to pray because I'm in chains. I'm in prison for preaching this word and pray that I will continue to take every last opportunity to do that. Paul asked his readers to pray for opportunities to communicate the gospel even though he was in prison for preaching that gospel message. Now, flip back with me to a parallel passage to this. Ephesians 6 verses 18 through 20. Just flip two books back, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. And we've looked back at this parallel passage in Ephesians in the last few Sundays. Verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. That matches the verse you and I looked at two weeks ago. Verse 19, and for me, pray for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. There's that same uh, description, mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Pray that even in prison for the preaching the gospel, even in chains, I will continue to preach that gospel as boldly as possible. If Paul the Apostle asked his brothers and sisters in Christ to pray for his boldness to share the gospel, don't you and I need to do that? When was the last time you asked a brother or sister or husband or child or parent to pray for boldness for you to be the witness you need to be? Wow, we need that. Is that how you would be thinking if you were in prison? That's how Paul's thinking. That's how we ought to be thinking. How are we thinking about sharing the gospel in this culture? Are we tippy-toeing around like little mice hoping nobody notices? 
or are we praying for boldness? We need to pray and trust the Holy Spirit for boldness in communicating that gospel message. If the Apostle Paul needed prayer, support for his boldness, we need it as well. We need as believers to increasingly stand out in our culture, not hide. Now the culture is putting pressure on us to hide. In fact, they're changing the definition of freedom of religion. If you've noticed that in the past year or two, they are not saying freedom of religion in the sense of practicing your religion everywhere. It's freedom to worship as you please. And they specify that as where you are in church on Sunday morning. It's okay yet at this point. You have freedom to worship Sunday morning in a church building like Believer's Bible Church. That's okay. But don't bring it outside the walls of that. We don't want to hear it. What's our response to that? Are we going to be like Paul? Are we going to be bold and uh, raise the name of Jesus Christ, which is the only answer to our culture's problems? Are we going to glorify him as we sang before? Are we going to raise him up? Are we going to say, shine, Jesus, shine through my whole life? Or am I going to only Sunday morning whisper his name inside the walls with other brothers and sisters in Christ? Now, you see, we know better than that. We say, no, 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 that's not right. We shouldn't be doing that. But is that what we're doing? Practically in our life, is that what we've let them force us into? That's what's wrong with this culture. No right politician elected to office and no right laws are going to straighten out the mess we're in. It's only Jesus Christ, and they don't know about him. And they don't want to learn about him. They don't want to come here to learn about him. They need to hear him out there where they are and how his truth affects their lives where they are at. That's what Paul's interested in doing, taking the gospel wherever he was, including prison. We must believe that we have the most important message on this planet for this culture, for the students in your classroom, for the people at your work, for your neighborhood, whatever it is, this is the most important message. You see, just like in 90 Minutes of Heaven, if this guy saw heaven and he kept it a secret, uh, that was the most important thing to his life. Absolutely everything else was blanked out. I mean, he didn't care anymore about his wife or kids or anything. He just wanted to be in heaven. It is so great. And God is saying, I have given you a description of heaven and hell, and there's nothing more important than that for eternity. Your life, James says, is like a vapor coming off a boiling pot. It's gone in a second, and eternity lasts forever. There's nothing more important than that. Why aren't you all about that? Wow, what is God going to say to us someday? You say, well, okay, maybe this is optional. Maybe this is for apostles only. <laughs> Let's look at, Paul says, our need to share the gospel clearly. We are obligated to share the gospel. Paul said he was obligated. Look at verse 4. He says, he qualifies, a qualifying phrase, pray for me that doors would open for, the, for me to speak the mystery of Jesus Christ, for which I'm also in change. That, or so that, I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. I want to look at the last half of the verse first, okay? Can I reverse that? He says, as I ought to speak. Now, <laughs> we might use the word as I should, and, you know, I, we live in a generation where we don't like shoulds. We live in a culture that says, don't, tell any, don't let anybody tell you what you should do. They're trying to influence. They're trying to control your life. You be yourself. You be your own individual. You just do what you feel like doing. I'm going to tell on my daughters here. I've had them say to me as a parent, always telling me what I should do. I don't like to hear that. You know, this isn't just should. That's not the word. The word, I ought to speak, means I'm under an obligation. I'm under a compulsion to share the gospel. Paul says, I don't have a choice. This is God's call for me. 
I am obligated to share the gospel even in prison, even if it ends in my death, my execution. I am under compulsion to share the gospel, and we can look at other passages which match that. I must preach the gospel. It is not optional. It is not uh, if I ever get around to it or feel like it or the opportunity is un undeniable or everything's perfect or whatever. I must preach the gospel. I must share this word. I ought means I am under the obligation to. That's what the Greek word means. And you and I are obligated as well. We are his ambassadors. We are his witnesses. Now maybe God hasn't asked you to be a foreign missionary and go to Africa and do it, but we are obligated to be a witness for him wherever we are. We have the same obligation. Maybe not to the same areas and people that Paul did, but we have an obligation to be a witness, to be an ambassador, to glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Everything in our life ought to glorify him. That doesn't mean just secretly in the deep accesses of my heart. That's part of it. But I need to be glorifying him in my culture and in my work and wherever I am. We must remind ourselves often and seek to fulfill that obligation. We are obligated just like Paul. As I ought to speak, as I must speak, as I'm obligated to speak, as I'm under compulsion to speak, I'm not going to sit here in prison and be quiet. And then we need to communicate it clearly. First part of that verse, that I may make it manifest. Manifest, meaning that he wants to communicate it clearly. The Greek word translate manifest means to cause, to become clearly revealed in the mind, the senses, or the judgment of other people. Pray that, Paul says, I can share the gospel in prison in such a way that it becomes clear. It crystallizes. People understand it. They, they, it it's, it's logical in their mind. They can think through why God's word and the gospel and Jesus is the only way to heaven and there's no other way and my whatever I'm trying to do won't make it and whatever. Pray that their senses, their judgment, all of that, that it becomes clear to them. You and I need to share the gospel as clearly, as crystal clearly as we possibly can. Now, don't let that stop you. All right? The only way that we're going to do that well is to practice. You don't go into a tennis tournament or a football tournament or whatever uh, watching the television screen and watching every move they make and reading books and then go play the top tournament. It takes practice. You and I need to be sharing the gospel and improving and looking for ways and asking the Holy Spirit. And, you know, we can study. We, we, we've uh, given training here how to share the gospel very, very clearly. That's important. We need to know the message well. And we want to use clear illustrations if we can. And we want to communicate the importance of this issue. It's not, oh, by the way, someday if you get around to it, maybe you'll have a time on your deathbed. You should think about this. That's not the clear gospel. This is the most important issue in their life. And you and I need to share it that way. And we need to be sure, at the end of sharing the, the content, that we invite them to put their faith in Christ. That is the crucial thing. If they walk away and don't, don't respond by believing, then they're not going to heaven. They're still depending on something they're doing or some church ritual or whatever the case might be. I mean, be clear. Be crystal clear. Use every facility God has given us and every talent and, and the logic and everything in your testimony and be clear and share Jesus Christ with them and the importance of this issue and invite them to put their faith in Jesus Christ to believe in him as their only way to heaven. There's no more important message in the whole world. And why is it not important to them? Maybe they've never seen anybody communicate it as being important to them. You know, I read some time ago a testimony of where a, a guy got up in a restaurant to uh, acknowledge atheist and shared the gospel with him right there publicly at his table and shared it in such a clear, forceful way. And this guy, who was kind of a really rough biker type guy who could have probably gotten up and thrown the believer right out through the window. 
said rather, you know what, if I believed what you believe, I'd be sharing it like you're sharing it. And that's how we ought to share it, right? Because it's a crucial message. It's life or death, eternal life or death. We have seen in this passage today that we are to pray for and use opportunities to share the gospel with those who do not yet know they are on their way to heaven. That is our obligation. That's what we're to do. And Paul is praying, asking people to pray that he would do that in prison. Our prayers for one another ought to include asking God to open opportunities for us to share the gospel. If Paul needed prayer for his being bold in sharing the gospel, so much the more do we need prayer for boldness to share the gospel. We are obligated to share the gospel and to communicate it very clearly. Now, of course, we don't have a rough time theologically understanding these two verses today. They're pretty plain and clear. And we don't have a rough time understanding how we should apply these two verses. That's pretty clear. Paul has modeled that really well. We struggle with, what are we going to do about this? Is this going to change our life? You know, I hope you don't come to church just to see what somebody is wearing or feel good. I hope you feel good coming to church, but I hope that's not your purpose in coming. We need to come to be changed, to grow, to ask the Holy Spirit to use the Word of God to change us. What am I going to do about this? How am I going to respond to this? That's the challenge in these verses. Am I going to be the witness and ambassador for Jesus Christ boldly that Paul is, even in prison? Can I be that in freedom when I don't really have, you know, that threat? Can, can I stand for God? Can I really glorify him as we sing and make him shine in my life? Am I willing to do that? It will take a change. It will take a commitment. You see, we have good intentions. Someday we'll want to get around to that. We don't know if we have a someday. We don't know if we have a tomorrow. God is not going to evaluate our intentions about next year. He's going to evaluate what we did today. Jesus Christ came with one focus in his life, and that was to share who he was and that people needed to believe in him and to pay the way for that salvation as he died on the cross. There is no other focus in his life. He was committed. He expects you and I to be committed to be his witnesses to that message as well. Are we willing to become more diligent in our prayers for opportunities to share the gospel? Is that going to be a daily, that should be a habit, a daily prayer for you and for brothers and sisters in Christ. Give us opportunities to share the gospel with those who need to hear it. You know, sometimes we're oblivious to them. I know I have walked away from a situation and said, you know what, that was an opportunity to share the gospel, and I missed it. I was focused on something else, what I was going to buy in the store, or whatever the case was, I don't know. We just totally missed it. Then there's sometimes when I walk away and I said, you know, the thought occurred to me, that was an opportunity to put in a word for Jesus Christ, and I failed. I didn't do it. We need to learn from those situations. We need to pray that God would make us aware of the opportunities that he's opening the doors and that we'd be bold to use them. Are we willing to commit ourselves to make and take those opportunities to share the gospel? Practically this morning, how are we going to respond to that? You know, many of us, all of us, should be capable of sharing our testimony. And we need to be clear about that, not need to beat around the bush. And we need to be clear about, you know, before this point in my life, whenever that was for you, I was on my way to hell. Oh, I was going to church and I was doing good things and everybody else thought I was great. But, you know, if I'd have died back then, I'd have gone to hell because I'd never put my faith. I never understood that it was by Jesus Christ alone. I never put my faith in Jesus as my only way to heaven. And that's the only key. That is the only ticket. That is the only way to heaven. And I was trying everything else. But at that point, I realized the gospel and the truth of it. And I put my faith in Christ. And now I know I'm going to heaven. That's your testimony. You've got to share that clearly. Every one of you are capable of sharing your testimony. Everyone. 
Now you can practice and get better at it. If you want help, come, come ask us. We can help you. It's amazing. I took lots of teams over to foreign uh, countries, and we asked them all to write out and prepare their testimony. And it's amazing how much help they needed, okay? <laughs> they want to talk about all kinds of other things, how they reformed their life and how last week they were committed and they're growing. That's all fine. Tell me about when you put your faith in Christ. You know, they struggle to put that together very clearly, and we had to help them do that, but they could, and they did it. They went over and gave it. <laughs> it's a great growing experience for them. All of us should be able to give our testimony. And you know, if you want help, come ask us. We'd love to help you. This is what the Church of Jesus Christ is about. It's its primary task as far as the world. Yes, we're here to worship God. We do that every Sunday. And yes, we're here to help one another grow and disciple and fellowship and all those things. And evangelism is a very important part. We are to be out there as witnesses. And if we can help you other ways, you know what? I want to offer you this morning. If you can get together some unbelievers who people have never put their faith in Christ yet, and you can invite them to your house, I'm willing to come and do what we call among believers an evangelistic Bible study. You invite them and say, hey, why don't you come to my house for eight Mondays in a row? We're just going to look at the Bible and what it says. Maybe you know they have an interest on a certain topic. Maybe you'll say, you know, you've asked questions and talked about, where's this world going? This is not the right direction. What's going to happen here? You know, the Bible has a lot to say about what's going to happen in the future. Wouldn't you like to come to my house and get a couple people together? Let's just look at the Bible together about what it, where, what's happening in our world, where it's going. Maybe that's what they want to come talk about, and we will, and we'll share the gospel as part of it. I'd be willing to be a part of that if you can invite a group to your house. Sharon is willing to, again, do another art Bible study, okay? Where, um, invite ladies especially. Uh, you, if you have someone who um, hasn't put their faith in Christ yet, she's got some of these little brochures made up. You can actually even hand this out if you want to to someone who doesn't know Christ and say, you know what, we're going to go take an art class, and um, I, I want you to be my guest and come with me. That's your ticket to coming, okay? <laughs> you bring a lost lady, you can come. And we're going to have this, learn how to paint this picture. And afterwards, we're going to sit down and just look at what the Bible has to say about some very applicable things to our lives. She's got dates. She's, she's ready to go in October. Practical things. You understand what I'm saying? We as a church need to get in gear and reach lost people. That's what we're all about. And so we want to help do that. Are we willing to commit, as Paul is in prison, praying for opportunities and boldness to share the gospel? It is the most important message and issue in the world. And you and I need to be serious about it as well. Father, thank you that the Apostle Paul can ask for prayer, for boldness, for opportunities to share the gospel, and you answered. You gave him opportunities out of that hole in the ground to get the gospel all the way up into Caesar's household. Oh, do we need that in our culture today. That's only going to happen if we as believers are as bold as Paul was and committed and serious about the most important message in the world and not selfishly keep it inside of these walls. We need to glorify you and make you shine in our lives no matter where we are. Father, that for many of us, that will necessitate a change, a commitment, so that we can get busy. We're so busy about so many things that are not eternally significant. And yet you have us breathing here on this earth for a purpose. And it's not to fill space. You want us to be your witnesses, your ambassadors. We are obligated, like Paul. Help us to get serious about being the witness we need to be. And your Holy Spirit can use us. We might be awed, we might be surprised. Not only at what you did through Paul in prison, but what you'll do in our lives. 
Help us practical, practically to step out and reach those who desperately need, they're dying literally for eternity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he did for them. In Jesus' name.